On July 2nd, 2009, a woman died tragically in her own home. Lisa Patterson was found in her home gym with a barbell crushing her neck. Her husband, Scott, called 911, and they rushed Lisa to the hospital. However, Lisa was pronounced dead shortly after arrival. It was a terrible, tragic freak accident. But as police opened an investigation, everything started to seem less and less like an accident. Evidence from the investigation and even an autopsy report revealed several inconsistencies that made investigators look into this incident further. But can these inconsistencies be explained away? A lot of people think so. This case is very, very complicated, and it still leaves a lot of people questioning. So there is a lot of evidence to go over, and then you can decide for yourself, what side of the case do you stand on? Guys, I'm Annie Elise, this is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. All right, guys, you know I love my Beam Dream Sleep Tea. I drink it every single night. I'm anniversary, I think like a year of drinking it because it has just improved my sleep so, so much. I've gotten my friends hooked on it, my family hooked on it, so many of you viewers hooked on it. I mean, it tastes like a little desserty treat right before bed. It has zero grams of sugar. It's only 15 calories, and it puts you to sleep. You stay asleep. You don't wake up groggy. It is the best. Before I tried Beam, I'll just be honest, guys, I tried Ambien, Valerian Root, straight melatonin, all of these things, nothing worked. And then Beam, it was like, ah, like the best thing to enter my life ever. And I also love that it's like a little dessert treat right before I go to bed. They have so many incredible flavors. They have sea salt caramel, brownie batter. I mean, all of the amazing, amazing things. And it's just so good. Now you may know too that I wear an aura ring. It tracks my sleep, my energy, all of kind of my like daily habits. When I tell you my sleep score used to be in the 50s and 60s and now it's in the high 90s, that just shows you. It's science, guys. It works. And everybody I've ever introduced to it is also hooked on it. So don't take my word for it. Take their word for it. But I'm telling you, if you struggle with sleep, you need to try Beam. You really do, guys. Quit waiting. It's clinically proven to improve sleep, so click my link in the description below or my QR code on the screen and use my code 10 to life and save 20% off. So go get hooked up, sweet dreams, enjoy Beam, and let me know what you think. From the time that Lisa was born, she was energetic, she was warm, she was creative, and she was somebody who always worked very, very hard to accomplish her goals. Now that last trait was tested when she found out that she was pregnant in her early 20s, and that's when she had a son named Dylan. Now Dylan's father wasn't in their lives, but regardless of whether or not he was going to be involved, Lisa knew that she was going to make sure that Dylan had everything he needed, and even then some. So although she was young, single, and at times it seemed like she had everything just working against her, Lisa was still the best mom that she could possibly be. Now, I'll be honest, being a parent is exhausting, and it's completely draining at times, so I can only imagine what it's like being a single parent with no support from the other parent. Now, Lisa's family did help out where they could, but the majority was on her, and it was tough. So one night in 1995, she decided to just go out, have a child-free night out with her friend and with her sister, Christine. They went to a nightclub in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And while she was at the club, Lisa noticed a guy who was big, he was muscular, he was attractive, and he noticed her right away as well. He was a few years older than her, but they both instantly clicked. His name was Scott, and they ended up dancing and talking all night until it was time for Lisa to leave. Now, before she left, Scott gave her his business card with his phone number on it so they could stay in touch. But when Lisa looked at this card, she was kind of surprised because it didn't show a traditional job title on it. Instead, the card said that Scott was a Jean-Claude Van Damme lookalike. 
If you don't know Jean-Claude Van Damme, he was a famous martial arts guy who became an action movie star in the 80s and the 90s. And apparently Scott made a living impersonating him, because apparently Jean-Claude Van Damme lookalikes were like high in demand at the time. I don't know, but this is what he did. Had the business card to prove it. So after Lisa said her goodbyes to Scott, all of the girls left the club and they called a cab. Once they got in the car, Christine made a comment to Lisa about how ridiculous Scott was. Christine didn't like him. He was loud. She kind of just got a bad vibe from him right away. And Lisa's friend was in complete agreement with Christine, with her sister. But Lisa didn't agree. She was genuinely interested in Scott. And she told them that she was going to call him. Now, Christine was shocked that Lisa was even thinking about calling him. She thought that Lisa would for sure have found him weird, annoying, all of the things. But Lisa ended up calling him a few days later. And that was the start of her forever because they fell in love super quick, and they got married just a year later in August of 1996. Their wedding happened to be a fairy tale theme, so Lisa wore this beautiful white princess type dress. She arrived at the wedding in a white horse-drawn carriage, and during the reception, Scott wore a beast type mask, like Beauty and the Beast. I mean, I'm talking true fairy tale, through and through. And while the wedding was supposed to feel a lot like a fairy tale, a lot of people thought it was a little weird. It was out of the norm. Now, Lisa was a creative person, so her dress and the horse-drawn carriage made sense, but the mask seemed a little strange. We see a lot of beautiful fairy tale weddings. Not all the time do we see somebody wearing like the Beauty and the Beast beast mask. And on top of all of that, it wasn't just her sister Christine who didn't like Scott. Most of Lisa's family didn't vibe with him either. But Lisa was happy, and she was so happy on her wedding day, so her family was happy for her. At the end of the day, their main concern was that Lisa was happy and that she was being treated well, and from everything that they could see, she was. Lisa also loved the fact that Dylan now had a father figure, somebody to look up to. Scott took on the role of being a father pretty quickly, and Dylan started referring to Scott as dad. They settled down in rural central Indiana, and Scott gave up his dreams of being a successful Jean-Claude Van Damme impersonator, and instead he started his own roofing company. And Lisa started working as a marketing manager for the Five Points Mall in Marion, Indiana. She became a member of the Ambassadors Club of Marion, the Great County Chamber of Commerce, the Marion Rotary Club, and she also got really involved in her church. She also picked up a few hobbies like painting, crafting, scrapbooking. Now how she had all of this time for this, I have no idea, but she made it look super easy. So on the outside looking in, Scott and Lisa truly did have it all. They ended up moving into a very big house in the country. They went on vacations to the Caribbean and they would often throw very elaborate themed parties at their house. Scott was known as a fun guy, and he always took things to the next level during these parties, too. And he just wanted everything to be bigger, better. And he really took that mentality into everything that he did, especially when it came to working out. So Scott and Lisa were both really into health and fitness, but Scott was specifically focused on his appearance. They both ate healthy, and they ended up even turning their basement into a gym, which it had like a weight bench, a treadmill, it even had a tanning bed, because remember, this was the 90s, and like tanning was all the rage. Not so much anymore. But it was something that they both enjoyed doing together. That was until July of 2009. At 12.14 p.m. on July 2nd, Scott made a very frantic 911 call. He told the dispatcher that he had come home and he had found Lisa in their home gym stuck on the weight bench. She had a 105 pound barbell on her throat. She was blue in the face with her arms just dangling at her sides. So Scott ran to her and he tried to administer CPR, but it didn't do any good. So he put her in the backseat of his truck and he started jetting toward the hospital. The dispatcher said that they would send an ambulance to meet him halfway but Scott said that it wouldn't be necessary. See, he had been trained in CPR, but it wasn't helping, so he didn't think that the EMTs would be able to do anything more for Lisa. But the dispatcher sent the ambulance and a police escort anyway, so they met Scott as he was driving, and Lisa was moved from Scott's truck to the ambulance, and then they all headed to the hospital. As soon as they arrived, doctors tried their best to revive Lisa, but they couldn't get a pulse and she was pronounced dead shortly after arriving. So investigators, of course, showed up, and they started asking Scott about what had happened. 
and Scott told them all about his day. He said that he woke up around 5 a.m. because he had to run an errand to the landfill. Since he was a roofer, that was apparently something he had to do pretty often. He said that before he left, he kissed Lisa goodbye on his way out the door. He finished up then at the landfill, and he was back at the house by 6.30 a.m. Now, Lisa's son, Dylan, he was a teenager by then, and he had recently started working with Scott on different roofing projects. And there was a job that day. So Scott picked up Dylan and another employee at the house, and he took them to the job site. Scott said that he did some work, then he left early because he had a doctor's appointment for a back injury, and apparently he wanted to shower and get ready for the appointment. So he did some errands, and he got back home around 11.30 a.m., and that's when he started calling out for Lisa. And as far as he knew, she didn't have any plans that day. But she didn't respond. And he wasn't too worried at first, though, because he heard music coming from the downstairs gym. So he figured she was probably just working out. So he wandered around the house for 10, 15 minutes before then heading downstairs to check on her. And then that's when he found her on the weight bench. Scott told the officer the same thing that he told the dispatcher. Lisa was blue. She was limp. She was unresponsive. He got her off the bench, he tried to administer CPR, and then when that didn't work, he got her into the truck and he started heading to the hospital. He called 911 as soon as he was backing out of the driveway, too. The hospital ended up listing Lisa's cause of death as, quote, unattended. Now, usually that term is used for people who die and aren't found for days, weeks, or even months. And it's often used for older people who die of natural causes. Now, Lisa wasn't lying around for days, and she also wasn't older. She was only 36 years old, but she was alone when she died, which is why the medical examiner listed her cause of death as unattended. Police assumed that Lisa probably died before Scott even got home, but they did have to open up an investigation because it was standard protocol to look into this. It really did seem like Lisa's death was truly an accident though, so they really weren't expecting to find out much. They searched Scott's truck and they didn't find anything out of the ordinary. They also did a physical inspection of Scott, and they found that his body didn't have any defensive wounds or marks, really, of any kind. The house looked normal. There were no signs that somebody had broken in, no signs of a struggle. Everything in the basement gym seemed to be completely normal, too. Then, investigators saw two security cameras outside of the garage, and they found the storage and the recording device for them. So, they wanted to look at the security footage from the day of Lisa's death. But the recording device had a DVD tray, and it was empty. So they figured that the cameras needed a DVD to record, and since the DVD tray was empty, there wouldn't be any footage to be found, so they didn't look further into it. Still, while everything was technically checking out, the investigators felt like something was off here. What's the point of having security cameras if you can't go back and look at the footage? Why wasn't there a DVD in the security camera's recording device? They also didn't like how Scott refused the ambulance on that 911 call, because why would somebody refuse emergency services when their wife was dying? Even if CPR hadn't worked for Scott, the trained paramedics might have known more and they might have been able to help her. So a detective also decided to look into the weight room a little bit further. And that is when he found something that seemed very off about the workout bench. The weight bench wasn't a bench with free weights. It was a machine called a Smith machine. Now, a Smith machine has a barbell that's attached to a vertical pole on either side. So the barbell can't be removed, like on a traditional weight bench. It's attached to the poles, which allow for vertical movement so that the barbell can move up and down. A Smith machine is used for a lot of things, like squats, chest presses, and it's generally considered more safe than just a regular barbell weights rack kind of thing. Anyway, now that I've explained the machine to you, along the vertical poles on either side are very small holes or latches, and then there are hooks at either end of the barbell that can hook onto those latches. And that's how the barbell then stays in place when it's not being used. When you want to use the machine, you grab the bar and you use your wrist to rotate the bar and then pull the hooks out of the latches. You do your exercises and then you rotate the bar to hook it back into place. The idea is that if someone is lifting something that they feel is too heavy, they can easily just rotate the bar and hook it back into place instead of weights falling to the floor or on top of them. And those latch holes are along the entire length of each vertical pole, so the barbell can be hooked back into place at any level. The machine also has safety stops that can be placed onto the vertical poles. They are an additional safety measure, and they can catch the bar if it happens to fall before being hooked into place. 
So it really seemed like the machine should have made it easy for Lisa to escape if the bar fell on her. All she had to do was slightly rotate her wrists, hook the bar back into place, and then slide out from underneath the bar. It was definitely heavy, but it wasn't something that she wouldn't normally be able to do. Investigators also noted that the safety stops weren't on the machine. They were lying on the floor next to it instead. They couldn't figure out why the safety stops had been removed, since there was no reason to remove them. In fact, they were supposed to prevent exactly what had happened. Investigators also noted that the bench was in a strange place beneath the bar. It was placed so that the bar was directly above somebody's neck, and not above their chest like it should have been. Lisa had apparently been doing chest presses right before she died. So, if that was the case, why was the bench placed in such an unsafe position? Plus, if Scott was such a fitness junkie, and he had been one for years, he should know how to properly set up a weight bench, right? He was the one who used the weight bench more often anyway. Lisa didn't really ever use it at all. In fact, when her son Dylan heard the news about his mom's death, he was really confused by the fact that she was found on the weight bench. He had only ever seen her use it once, and that was while Scott was helping her, while he was there to assist. Now, friends and family members also thought it was strange, because they knew that Lisa was more into aerobics and cardio. The only time that she ever lifted weights was when she held a few lighter weights in her hands while, you know, walking on a treadmill, like little hand weights. A friend of Lisa's even told investigators that Lisa had an old neck injury that prevented her from lifting anything too heavy, period. She said that Lisa couldn't even lift up Christmas decorations to hang at work, so she definitely would not have tried to lift a 105-pound barbell. So detectives continued to search, and the math was not mathin'. See, a few months before Lisa died, somebody had called in a domestic dispute between Scott and Lisa. When the police arrived, they realized that nothing physical was happening, it was just a really loud argument. And because the situation wasn't physical, the police left, and no further action was taken. In addition to all of that, though, the police found an old suspicious report from back in 2001. Somebody had called 911 and said that Scott had asked them to kill Lisa. Now, obviously, this person didn't do anything about Scott's request, but Scott seemed serious when he asked about this. So the person, because of this, decided to alert the authorities because they were worried about Lisa's safety, of course. Now, Scott made things seem like their relationship never had any problems, but this report made it seem like they were having serious issues, even seven years before Lisa died. At the time of the report, police did look into this accusation. However, they didn't find any evidence to prove that the report was legit, and the whole thing ended up being dropped. Still, all of it together seemed like too big of a coincidence to ignore, right? And that made investigators even more suspicious. So they decided they were going to bring Scott into the police station for a more formal interview. And during that interview, red flag after red flag kept popping up. Scott said that while he was driving to the hospital, Lisa had fallen to the floor, and that, quote, it was hard to drive and reach back there to hold a body. Now, this comment was strange, because Lisa wasn't officially dead while Scott was driving to the hospital. So why was Scott already referring to Lisa as a body before he had any confirmation that she was dead? And even if she was dead, it seemed like a really strange comment to make to refer to your wife of 13 years as just a body and not as Lisa. And we talk about this sometimes in other cases where it feels almost like they're detaching without even knowing it. They're subconsciously detaching and they don't refer to people by name anymore. They don't refer as though there's any sort of close relationship. And this was setting off a red flag for investigators. So then the detective started asking Scott about his and Lisa's relationship. And that's when they learned that their relationship was not as perfect as it seemed. In fact, it was the exact opposite. Scott and Lisa had recently been dealing with a lot of issues, and their relationship was extremely rocky. Scott admitted to the detectives that he also had been cheating on Lisa. He had been seeing a married woman named Stacy Henderson for years. Now, Stacy was married to a law enforcement officer, and she also worked for the mayor. And Lisa found out about this affair just months before she died. You just have coincidence after coincidence after coincidence. 
Now, Scott said that he stopped the affair as soon as Lisa found out, but he said that he initially had filed for divorce right after she learned about it. They didn't end up going through with the divorce, and apparently Lisa agreed to work on things as long as Scott agreed to be faithful. Now, on top of Scott's interview with police, a more detailed autopsy report was released by the medical examiner. Lisa had a bruise on her neck and also an abrasion on her shoulder, and it matched the story that Scott told. The medical examiner also determined that Lisa's cause of death was suffocation. And while that wasn't all too surprising, the information that followed was surprising. Apparently, the medical examiner found that Lisa's air supply was cut off very, very slowly like something was gradually pushing down harder and harder on her neck, which if a barbell fell on your neck, the compression would not be slow. It would be fast. It would be hard. So hard that it could cause major injuries to your throat, your neck, and your spine. Except Lisa did not have any significant injuries to her neck region or even her back. If a barbell genuinely fell on her and it was so heavy that she couldn't lift it off of her, her voice box her trachea, it all, everything in that area would be crushed. They were slightly compressed, but the injuries were not consistent with having a 105-pound bar falling straight onto her neck. She would likely have had broken bones in her spine as well, but her back was relatively fine. So medical examiners played with the idea that maybe Lisa could have suffered from a heart attack, causing her to then drop the bar and preventing her from lifting it back up. The Smith machine was made so that it should be easy to re-rack the bar, so something like a heart attack was the only logical explanation for why Lisa couldn't have lifted it back up. Something had to have been physically preventing her from doing so. But the autopsy showed that Lisa didn't have a heart attack. She didn't have any sort of cardiac event that could have incapacitated her. So Lisa hadn't had any sudden health issues, and she didn't have any broken bones. However, the medical examiner did find small red dots all along her neck, all along her back, and also on her weight. Now, these small dots are called petechia, and they appear when there's bleeding underneath the skin. Basically, they appear when somebody is straining so hard that tiny blood vessels pop and the blood rises to the surface of the skin. I'm sure you've seen it sometime in your life or another. That's why the red dots appear, because the blood is rising to the skin. And those little red dots were all along Lisa's back and waist. Again, if the barbell had fallen on her, it would have been normal to see those little dots around her neck, but not along the rest of her body. So the medical examiner said it was almost like somebody was straddling Lisa and pushing down on her, causing her whole body to strain, not just her neck. So this information from the medical examiner, coupled with Scott's interview, I mean, it made Scott the number one suspect in this case, right? Detectives no longer believed that Lisa's death was an accident, and they started looking into Scott even more. They questioned Lisa's family, and as I said earlier, many of them talked about how weird it was for Lisa to be lifting weights. Yes, she was super into fitness, but she never lifted weights. Many of Lisa's friends and family members also talked about how they just generally didn't like Scott. Even though Lisa and Scott had been together for about 14 years at this point, Lisa's family never warmed up to Scott. Lisa's sister Christine felt the same way about Scott as she did on the night that Lisa first met him. Lisa's family also felt that Scott was incredibly harsh on Dylan, Lisa's son, and apparently Scott would create extremely harsh punishments for him, even for the smallest things. Apparently, there was one time when Dylan forgot to get the mail from the mailbox one afternoon. So then the next morning, Scott made Dylan take off his clothes and walk to go get the mail in just his underwear. It was winter, and it was early in the morning, so it was freezing outside. So it seemed like a very extreme, weird reaction on Scott's part, almost like he was trying to humiliate him, embarrass him, also make him freeze. I mean, all sorts of things. The punishment definitely did not fit the crime. Lisa's family also said that it never seemed like Scott even loved Lisa and that he definitely did not respect her. I mean, he was cheating on her, so clearly he didn't respect her. But he was also just apparently mean, rude, and kind of like took on this authority figure position. And while Scott said that they had put the divorce on pause, the more that detectives looked into it, the more it didn't seem true. Dylan said that he noticed his parents had put all of their wedding photos away, and they were also packing up the house to sell it. 
Detectives also discovered that Scott had contacted a real estate appraiser in November of 2008. Just what, eight, nine months before Lisa died? He said he wanted to know how much the house was worth to see if they could sell it, because then he could afford to divorce Lisa. And detectives realized that Scott wasn't just worried about paying for divorce lawyers. He was worried that Lisa would get part of his business if they separated. And in February of 2009, just months before Lisa died, Scott told a friend of Lisa's that he would never, under any circumstances, give over part of his business to Lisa if they were to divorce. So it was becoming more and more apparent to detectives that Scott was really hyper-focused on money. Lisa's sister Christine was their financial advisor as well, and she had been for many years. Well, months before she died, Lisa had visited Christine in Virginia, and she told her that her and Scott's marriage was over. So she wanted to take Scott off of her $450,000 life insurance policy. At the time, Lisa had both Scott and Dylan as her beneficiaries, but she wanted Scott removed from the policy completely, and she wanted to make sure that all of the money would go to Dylan if something were ever to happen to her. This was months before she died, guys. So after they talked, Christine got all of the paperwork ready, and she sent it to Lisa for her signature. But the thing was, Lisa never signed the papers. Then, the day after Lisa died, a gathering was held for her at the mall where she worked. And during the gathering, Scott pulled Christine aside, and he asked her if Lisa had signed the paperwork to change her life insurance policy. Now, Christine wasn't sure how Scott found out about it, but she told him that Lisa had not signed the papers. So it was discovered later that Dylan was the one who told Scott about Lisa changing the life insurance policy. But regardless, that interaction really stood out to Christine because it seemed like an odd thing to be worried about the day after your wife just died, right? Scott wasn't asking Christine about how she was doing after just losing her sister. I mean, he was more worried about what money he would or wouldn't be getting. And Christine told investigators that Scott had always been irresponsible with money. He was always spending it on lavish and very unnecessary things. A few years before, he had taken money out of his retirement account and even out of Lisa's retirement account without her knowing, and it was a pretty large sum of money too, and he had spent all of it. Scott was also acting weird and emotionless after Lisa's death. Lisa's mom told investigators that when Scott called her to tell her what had happened, he just said, you need to get to Marion General Hospital. They just pronounced your daughter as dead. I found her in the weight room. And then he just hung up the phone. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't think of a weirder and honestly more callous way to tell a mother that her daughter has just died. Scott had been in their lives for 14 years at that point, so you would think that he would break the news to Lisa's mom a little more gently, or at least with way more emotion, way more tact. Also, Scott had made it seem like his relationship with his mistress, Stacy, wasn't serious and that it was just some random fling. But that was not true at all. Stacy and Scott had been seeing each other for years, and Scott had professed his love for Stacy multiple times. Scott even told several different people that he loved Stacy and that he envisioned being with her one day. He would visit Stacy at her job and he would call her all the time. If he ever went to her office and she wasn't there, Scott would apparently get upset too, and he would go on these strange, angry, never-ending tangents to her coworkers. He told one of Stacy's coworkers that he loved Stacy and that he would leave his wife for her. He even told some random person that he purchased roofing supplies from that he loved Stacy and knew that they would be together someday. So he really was not shy about their relationship, and it didn't even seem like he was trying that hard to hide it from Lisa. I mean, the guy was basically telling everyone and anyone. So he was already being a terrible person by cheating on his wife, but he was also disrespecting Lisa even more by telling all of these random people that he was cheating on her. So investigators questioned Stacy, and Stacy told them that she and Scott were still very much together, and they had even talked on the day that Lisa died. Stacy said that they had taken a very short break after Lisa first confronted Scott about their affair. However, they resumed their relationship just a few months later. However, Lisa had stayed suspicious of Scott, and she had even told a friend that she had installed tracking information on Scott's computer. So as detectives looked more and more into this affair, it was clear that Lisa knew that some shady shit was going on. 
they found a letter in Lisa's handwriting dated just before her death, and it discussed Scott's affair and the marriage issues that they were having. One of Scott's employees told detectives that just a week before Lisa died, Scott had been complaining about her too, and he was also complaining about how difficult it was to live with her, even though they were getting a divorce. So when you look at everything, it did seem like Lisa and Scott were moving forward with the divorce, despite what Scott had told the detectives. But in spite of all of these things that I just mentioned, detectives still didn't feel like they had enough to arrest Scott. They needed something more concrete, because the evidence that they had was mostly circumstantial. Now fortunately for them, they didn't have to look too hard for that evidence, and it came right to them. On July 15th, 2009, an employee from the security company called Corson called the local police department. Now Corson was the company that installed the two security cameras at the Pattinson family home. If you remember, the police had looked into these cameras and they discovered that the cameras weren't recording. Well, this Corson employee called because Scott had just called them and he was asking some very weird questions about his security system. Specifically, he was asking if he could delete footage from the recording log. The detective told the employee that they already checked the security system at Scott's home and they found that that DVD tray was empty so the cameras weren't recording anything. But the employee said that wasn't true. The DVD was only there if you wanted to transfer information from one device to another. You would put the video file on the DVD, then you would put the DVD into another system and transfer the information that way. But the actual security footage? It was stored on an internal hard drive. And Scott was asking the employee how to delete videos from it. Now, I don't know what made this employee decide to call the police, but it seems like this case was receiving coverage in the area, and the employee must have seen it. So when Scott called and was asking these weird questions, he just put two and two together. He thought it seemed suspicious and, thankfully, decided to call the police. So as soon as the detectives received that information, they worked to get a search warrant for the security footage. They wanted to get it as soon as possible because they were afraid that Scott was going to realize how to erase these recordings or destroy the hard drive itself. Thankfully, they did get the search warrant, and they got that security footage before he could do anything to it. And what they saw on that footage, guys, would prove to be Scott's downfall. Because the story that Scott told police did not at all match up with what they found. Now, just to give you a refresher, Scott said that he went to the landfill at around 5 a.m., got back at 6.30 a.m., picked up Dylan and another employee, took them to the job site, and then returned home around 11.30 a.m. before eventually finding Lisa dead downstairs in the gym. But the security camera footage told a totally different story. The recordings were in full color and very clear, so it was very easy to tell who was on this footage. The cameras had a full view of the driveway, and they show Scott leaving at 5 a.m. and returning an hour and a half later to pick up Dylan and the other employee, so so far everything was lining up with Scott's story. But then the footage showed Scott arriving home at 8.32 a.m., then, at 10 a.m., he was seen on the footage again. He had changed his clothing, and he was talking to somebody on the phone while standing in the driveway. He went in and out of the house multiple times, once at 9.56 a.m., once at 10.03 a.m., and once at 10.07 a.m. And the whole time he was doing that, he was talking to somebody on the phone. At 11.38 a.m., he was seen on the footage again, but this time he was back in his work clothes, and they happened to be the same clothes that he had been wearing in the morning. Then, at 12.10 p.m., Scott backed up his truck, and he eventually drove to the hospital with Lisa. So at this point, investigators are like, oh, we have him. It was him. The security camera footage sealed the deal. It was the evidence that they needed, and there was no way that Scott was explaining his way out of this. So on September 28th, nearly three months after Lisa's murder, Scott was arrested for the murder of Lisa after the grand jury indicted him. Anything you say, Scott? I'm not guilty. Wabash County Sheriff's deputies booked Pattison into the county jail shortly after 3 Monday afternoon. They arrested him without incident at his mother's Grant County home after a grand jury handed down an indictment of murder against him. It comes almost three months after the death of his wife, Lisa. It happened on July 2nd at the couple's LaFontaine home. Scott Pattison told police he'd come home to find Lisa's body, lifeless, a barbell across her throat. 
Her death would later be ruled a homicide, clearly defining it was no accident. He was denied bail and his trial was set to begin in 2010. Now the prosecution knew that they would have to build a very strong case. Even though it seemed like they had a lot of evidence against Scott, a lot of it was basically circumstantial. While the security camera footage was a strong piece of evidence, there was not anything that could concretely prove that Scott killed Lisa. During the trial, the prosecution began laying out what they thought Scott's motive was. He was having a years-long affair, and he seemed to have no desire to end it. He wanted a divorce, but he was worried about the financial burden that it might cause. He was also worried that if he and Lisa divorced, she might take ownership of half of his business. And that was something that he could not accept. So he figured he could just avoid all of it by just killing Lisa. Plus, if she died by an accident, he would get half of her $450,000 life insurance policy. So he would avoid having to spend money on a divorce lawyer, and he would get more money in the long run. The prosecution focused heavily on the fact that even if the barbell fell on Lisa, she could have escaped from underneath it. One of the detectives who inspected the machine testified that he tried having the bar crush him, but found that even when the bar was sitting on his upper chest, he could still escape from underneath it. He also testified that he couldn't find anything wrong with the machine and that everything seemed to work perfectly fine. The prosecution even brought up the fact that Scott himself said that he had used it hundreds of times and that he had never experienced any sort of issues with it. An employee from the company that made the machine also testified in court too, and they explained more about how it was made and how it worked. They talked about how easy it would have been for Lisa to rotate the bar back into place. All it would have really taken was for Lisa to slightly rotate her wrists. And if you've ever used a Smith machine, you know exactly what I mean. It doesn't take much to put the bar back in place, even if it is heavy. Now, the actual machine from the Pattison home was even brought into the courtroom for the jury to see. So for a lot of the trial, a Smith machine was just sitting there in the courtroom. At one point in the middle of the trial, two officers demonstrated how easy it would be to escape from underneath the bar. The prosecution also showed the security footage, and they talked about how it did not match up with what Scott originally told the police. Scott testified that he was just nervous during his initial interview. He knew that because he was the husband, he would be looked at as the prime suspect. So he says that when he was questioned, he just panicked and he told a lie. Scott's phone records were also brought into evidence too. And if you remember, Scott was seen on that security camera footage walking back and forth from the house while he was talking to somebody on the phone. And phone records showed that Scott was actually on the phone with Stacy during that time. In fact, on the day of Lisa's death, Scott and Stacy exchanged around 130 text messages. And get this, right before Scott called 911, he sent Stacy a text which read 911. And he was still seen texting her as he was driving his wife, Lisa, to the hospital. And then later in the day, he sent Stacy a text that said, so is he trying to get closer to you since I'm free now? That's a sick way to say it. So literally on the same day that his wife died, Scott was sending texts claiming he was now free. And it sounded like he was concerned that her husband, Stacy's husband, was trying to get closer to him now knowing that Lisa was dead. I mean, it was so sick. So the prosecution really focused on Scott and Stacy's relationship, and he brought up the fact that the two stayed in very close contact, even after Scott was in jail. Scott's defense team was trying to make it seem like their relationship was some old fling, but the fact that they stayed in contact completely proved otherwise. Scott's sister and mother also testified during the trial, and they too tried to downplay Scott and Stacy's relationship. However, recorded jailhouse phone calls showed that Scott's mom and his sister Sharon were basically just acting like the middlemen between Scott and Stacy. Scott would give them letters to give to Stacy, and Stacy would do the same. Scott's mom said that she and Scott never talked about Stacy, but then the prosecution played a phone call that proved that they did, and they talked about her a lot. Sharon said that she would deliver cards between Scott and Stacy, and that Scott often told her how much he loved Stacy and wanted to be with her. I mean, it was crazy. So obviously the prosecution focused on this relationship because if Scott wanted to be with Stacy so badly, it could definitely serve as a motive for getting rid of Lisa. Many people thought and still think to this day that Stacy knew more about what happened than she was letting on. However, she testified that she knew nothing about it and that Scott had told her the exact same story that he told the police. 
However, a lot of people were not convinced, and they thought that she knew more. But it's important to note that Stacy's guilt is all just speculation, and there isn't anything to prove that she was involved. But like I said, many people are divided on that, and many people think that it could be very reminiscent with the Nicole Kessinger and Chris Watts case. Nicole said she never knew anything, and a lot of people think she definitely knew more of what happened, but there's no evidence to prove that. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy on Lisa also testified, and they said that Lisa's injuries were not consistent with what Scott said happened. If a barbell actually fell on Lisa's neck, she would have been severely injured and her throat would have been almost completely crushed. They also testified that Lisa had likely been dead for about two to three hours before she was brought to the hospital. So the prosecution's argument rested on a few things. The findings from the medical examiner, Scott's obsession with money, the fact that Scott said he and Lisa were trying to work on things when it was clear that they were going to divorce, his relationship with Stacy, the numerous lies he told, and how his story didn't match up with the security footage. Now, the defense based their argument on the fact that a lot of the evidence was circumstantial and that none of it proved that Scott killed Lisa. First, they said that just because Scott could have been in the house when Lisa died didn't mean that he was the one who killed her. She was downstairs playing music, so maybe Scott hadn't heard anything happen or he wasn't aware of anything that had happened. He could have been upstairs minding his own business and had no idea that Lisa was being crushed and dying. They also continued to claim that his relationship with Stacy was just a fling and that the messages between the two of them on the day that Lisa died were just normal conversations. And the phone call, they said, was just normal everyday conversation too. They were just checking in on each other. Stacy even testified that she and Scott weren't serious and that she didn't love Scott. Scott's defense team also brought up other instances of people dying under a Smith machine. In one instance in Iowa, a young boy was working out on the exact same machine and accidentally died because of suffocation. Now, the details of that incident were very similar to Lisa's case. The boy had lost control of the bar, it fell, it crushed his neck, and he was unable to escape and ultimately passed away. The defense even hired their own medical examiner, who said that Lisa definitely could have died from being suffocated under that bar. Also, if you remember, the original medical examiner said that the little red dots found all over Lisa's body were likely there because somebody was on top of her, straddling her, pushing down with a lot of force. But the defense's medical examiner said that if somebody was straddling and pushing down on Lisa, she should have had more of an injury to her back. The defense also had a toxicology report done on Lisa, stating that she had more than three times the normal amount of a specific weight loss medication in her system. And this specific medication can cause cardiac issues if it's taken at too high of a dose. So the defense argued that Lisa had taken too many weight loss pills. She suffered from a cardiac event that then caused her to drop this barbell and it prevented her from escaping. So after both sides made their arguments, the jury went in for deliberation. Now, originally, the jury was split. Seven jurors thought that Scott was guilty of murder, and five didn't. Some jurors felt like Scott's lies proved that he was guilty, while the others felt like they just made him a liar, but not necessarily a murderer. However, the jurors then asked to re-examine the weight bench, and they were allowed in the courtroom to examine the bench in private. While examining this bench, one female juror, who was about the same size as Lisa, sat on the bench and showed that she could in fact wiggle out from under the bar in a matter of seconds, even if the bar was on her neck and weighed 105 pounds. Someone even got on top of her and held her down, and that was the only time that she couldn't escape from under the bar. And apparently, that was what the jury needed to see, and it convinced the five remaining jurors that Scott was guilty. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Wise man needs to know to keep his mouth shut. That broken remark is all Scott Pattison could get out after receiving a 60-year prison sentence. The judge, on the other hand, had a lot to say about Pattison. He said Pattison left a trail of death and destruction in his wake, and the impact of this crime is beyond normal. I felt the same way he did. Uh, I thought his comments were right on the money. Um, and appropriate. And again, we're just very satisfied with the, the sentence the judge handed down. The relief poured from Lisa's family on their way out of the courtroom today. We're very, very happy and um, we, we feel a lot of closure with it. For the first time during this trial, we heard from Lisa's mom, Lucy Rich. I just knew from the first phone call that he did it and um, I'm just happy that he got 60 years.
Each family member had a strong message for Scott during the hearing. We don't want anybody to forget Lisa and who she is. And, you know, this is about Lisa, not about Scott. As for Scott's family. Juan, do you have anything to say? No, I don't. That's how you feel about the sentence. She said she didn't have anything to say. Immediately after his sentencing, his defense team filed a motion for a mistrial. They said that the jury engaged in misconduct by performing experiments on the Smith machine during uh, deliberations, but the motion was denied, and then his defense team filed an appeal. They said now Scott's constitutional rights were violated when the security equipment and footage went into evidence. According to them, the police didn't have enough probable cause to think that Scott was guilty and get a search warrant for the security footage. They argued that all of the evidence that investigators had before the security footage was all hearsay or it was irrelevant. For example, they said it didn't matter that Scott had taken money out of the retirement accounts. It didn't matter that he was sketchy with money. Those things had nothing to do with Lisa's death, and therefore they should not have been used as evidence. They also claimed that that phone call from the Corson employee was hearsay, as well as all of the information from Lisa's sister Christine. They claimed that there was no way to prove that this information was true. And once again, they argued that it was inappropriate for the jury to experiment with the Smith machine, and that Scott should have been present when the jury was examining it. However, the judge upheld the original conviction, stating that everything was done correctly, was done justly, and that the evidence against Scott was sufficient enough to prove his guilt. So Scott is currently serving his time at the Indiana State Prison, and his earliest possible release date is 2039. And in a very, very surprising turn of events, Stacy, his mistress, his lady-in-waiting, was arrested shortly after Scott's trial, and she was charged with perjury and false informing. If you remember, Stacy was married to a cop and also worked closely with the town's mayor. Well, apparently, she sent Scott a text saying that the mayor had told her that the investigators had ruled out foul play. The mayor said it never happened and that Stacy lied about it during her deposition. So she was charged with perjury and false informing, and she agreed to a plea deal. She agreed to plead guilty to the charge of false informing, and the felony charge of perjury was dropped in exchange for that. So she received 60 days of house arrest and a year of probation. Killer received her sentence today for lying to police. Stacy Henderson was involved with Scott Pattison. You may remember he killed his wife on a weight bench in their home in Wabash back in 2009. News Channel 15's Chris Hopper continues our coverage of this story from Studio 15 tonight. And Chris, you say Stacy Henderson agreed to a plea deal. That's right, Mark, and the judge accepted it today. She pleaded guilty to false informing. She will not serve any jail time, but she will be on probation for a year and home detention for 60 days. Henderson said nothing to our cameras on the way into the courtroom today. She sat quietly as the Wabash County judge accepted the plea and handed out her sentence. Thanks to the agreement, a felony charge of perjury was dropped. According to court documents, she lied to police during her deposition before the high-profile Scott Pattison murder trial. Now this, of course, just fueled the theories that Stacy knew more than she let on. But like I said earlier, that's all alleged, and there is nothing to prove that Stacy had anything to do with Lisa's death. Meanwhile, Lisa's family, of course, misses her deeply, but they are happy that justice was served. Unfortunately, Lisa's son, Dylan, lost the person who meant the most to him, his mom. But with the support of his family, he ended up going to college and has since lived a normal life. Now, as I said at the beginning, this case has had quite a bit of controversy over the years. Because some people really think that there wasn't enough evidence to convict Scott and that that Smith machine could have failed. So I'm interested to hear what you think. So leave your comments below and let me know what you think on this. And even though there's no evidence, let me know if you think that Stacy knew more, was involved, or at least knew it was going to happen. I like seeing your thoughts and comments and the dialogue go. So let's get the conversation going in the comments. All right, guys, thanks again for tuning in to another episode of 10 to Life. And until the next one, stay safe.